Coming up, a couple of launches. Russia wins gold with NASA. And news from Mars. Plus, is this the second coming of space? Stay tuned. Tomorrow starts now. And welcome to Space Vidcast Live, episode 7.03 for Saturday, February 8th, 2014. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me, as always, the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Carrie Ann Higginbotham will be your hosts for this show. We've got a ton of space news, but before we get into that, uh, we have moved over to Patreon instead of Space Vidcast Epic, and we're absolutely loving it over there. Uh, actually, a, a bunch of you have uh, signed up. If we take a look, we've got 61 patrons supporting Space Vidcast right now at $158 per episode, which means on average that's going to be around 600-ish dollars per month, assuming we do four episodes. And the great thing about Patreon is if we don't do an episode, that means that uh, we don't get paid, right? So if we don't perform, right. you don't pay us. Uh, it's a very, very fair way across the board. Now, um, we wanted to take a quick moment and thank a lot of the Space Vidcast patrons. It's actually one of the rewards. These are the people who signed up underneath the $5 plan who are helping to make this show go. So these are the people who are bringing Space Vidcast live to you each and every week. They're an integral part to Space Vidcast because without cash, cash, money, yo, we can't actually to the show. And then a special thank you to the producers of Space Vidcast. Anyone who spends $5 or more on Space Vidcast, these are those people. Uh, again, notice how much larger these groups and these uh, uh, names got over the past um, two, weeks. Uh, two weeks, essentially. It's right? been really incredible. It has been absolutely amazing. And the neat thing about Patreon is you can subscribe at any level that you want. So if you can only afford $1, then it's just what you know just do one dollar per show you know and keep in mind that's about the cost of a, a latte a one latte per month at your favorite coffee shop uh, is basically pays helps pay for this show which uh i think is pretty awesome and you know it is a live show with inspiring humans to explore the cosmos give up one coffee per month help inspire the cosmos, help make it go. I, I think it's absolutely incredible that this entire group of people has helped make that happen. Yeah, it's really amazing. And we love that you guys are coming along with us on this journey, that we're all doing this together. Uh, we really feel that uh, your contribution to this show is helping us, uh, like Ben said, you know, bring space to everyone. But that's really all because of you. And so we really appreciate that. Now, we're going to talk a little bit in the break. Um, so uh, for this particular live show, we moved away from uh, YouTube. There are certain goals on Patreon. We're very, very close. We're at 160 something right now, uh, or just under 160, I think it is. Um, once we hit $200, we reach our first goal. And uh, after this trying to get this live show going, realized, oh man, YouTube is not working for us. The technology platform just is not stable enough for Space Vidcast. So we're gonna be looking to move the platform over to live stream, and we want to do that on their $400 per month plan. So we're adding a brand new goal on Patreon after this show. The $400 um, per show goal will help us move the live shows over to live stream, give you a much more stable platform, um, and uh, I think it's gonna be a better all around live show. All right, uh, so enough of that. Let's get straight into space news here. Uh, Ariane 5 in an ECA configuration launches the ABS-2 and Athena Fetus. Cinq, quatre, trois, deux, unité, top, allumage moteur vulcain. Allumage confirmé. Top, allumage UAP, décollage. Now this launched on February 6th at 2030 Coordinated Universal Time. This is the 58th consecutive successful launch of the Ariane 5 That's in this incredible. configuration. I know, absolutely. Now the ABS-2 payload is a telecommunications satellite that will be uh, used in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, Russia, Central Asia, and India. And um, the Athena 
Fetus, I believe is how you pronounce that, uh, payload is a military satellite that's going to be used for France and Italy. And they're basically going to have to trade off control of who has it. Um, if I remember right, and I might have this backwards, France has something like five beams and Italy gets two beams, mm. something like that. But they're going to coordinate how the military uh, portions of that work and they split the cost of that. Uh, as well. And speaking of launches, the Progress M22M launched for the International Space Station. This is an unmanned craft sending uh, cargo and supplies up to the International Space Station on a quick trajectory. Here's the launch. And we have the internal reverse stage engine standing by for liftoff. Off of the Soyuz rocket, uh, delivering a Progress vehicle, the 54th Progress vehicle to the International Space Station, the 148th launch in support of ISS assembly and operations. And that launched on February 5th at 1623 coordinated time. And then it used a six hour International Space Station approach. Here you can, I love this imagery, this by is the way. Really it's just gorgeous. There's a shot right after this one where it's like, yes. Yeah. And you can see it kind of sliding up. I love that shot. Uh, it birthed with the space station February 6th at 2222 coordinated uh, time. So that was a, a very, very quick approach to the International Space Station. Very. And you can see. And boom, there you go. <laughs> and we have contact. Huzzah. So that's a resupply mission to the International Space Station uh, that just happened uh, earlier this week. And speaking of uh, progress and by nature, uh, um, uh, Soyuz, it looks like the United States is looking to purchase six more seats on Soyuz. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, NASA, of course, wants to ensure that they can get their astronauts uh, up to the International Space Station. And because NASA themselves are not flying humans at the moment. Space shuttle retired. There you go. Uh, NASA decided to purchase seats upon the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. Again, uh, again. Yes, more. A more of them. Uh, there wasn't any pricing in this particular deal that's been laid out for what we can tell. Uh, but the last time this purchase was made, it was 70 point, is that 70 point seven uh, million dollars per astronaut seat, which is really, really quite impressive. <laughs> um, this pretty much guarantees that they can, uh, that NASA can launch their own astronauts through the end of 2017 with return trips to Earth reserved through early of 2018. Uh, NASA's expected the first crewed commercial demonstration, which means not via Soyuz and also not via NASA themselves necessarily, uh, through in the fall of 2017. Which is interesting because you listen to the commercial companies and they're saying, no, no, we'll be ready 2015. And yeah. NASA's like, no, no, you'll be ready 2017. So it'll be interesting to see who's actually correct, if right? If I may really quickly, there was something that was said very specifically about this one. Uh, Quote unquote, NASA needs to secure crew transportation with a known reliability for the near term to ensure a continued U.S. President's presence aboard the International Space Station until, until, which I think is the key word there, the sustained availability of a U.S. commercial vehicle. So I think what they're kind of saying is, all right, we already reserve these seats on Soyuz, but just in case. Hmm. Nobody can get going uh, between here and there. I think if a uh, commercial can really pull through, uh, it'll be interesting to see if they can get their money back. <laughs> Maybe they only paid a deposit. Maybe they... right. actually, actually, in all fairness, I don't believe they paid. They just announced their intention to do this. Yeah, I suppose, so, yes. Uh, it is a little bit different um, uh, in that regard. Uh, a couple other cool things. So th that's happening, which means basically the U.S. can get to the International Space Station via Russia, uh, the Soyuz, through 2017 and come back Early through 2018. 2018. Uh, it's generally six months stints, which is why they want the uh, the return window to be a little bit longer. Uh, Curiosity has shot some epic shots of Earth. Here's one picture. Now this is actually, this is size down. Uh, if you're watching this online live, this might be kind of hard to see. Sorry. So yeah, right. So we, we do have the next image zoomed in a little bit. Uh, it still might be hard to see, but then there's a little dot up there. Just that's, a little white one. That's Earth. That's actually even further in. That's Earth. And if you look a little bit down, if you're watching On Demand, watch this in 1080p and you can even pause it. That's okay. We'll wait. Do, do, do. So if you look a little bit down, you can even see the moon. Now, the, this picture was taken November 19th from the NASA 
Mar the NASA, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, or MRO, uh, and that's not true at all. No, sorry. That was on Curiosity. That was from Curiosity. I'm like, Mass MRO can't take this picture. Camera. Yo, man, I'm reading the wrong notes. That's okay. Uh, this was taken on Sol 529, which was January 31st, one day after my birthday. Yeah. This was done on uh, Curiosity. <laughs> it got both the Earth and the Moon in the shot, but the Moon uh, and the Earth kind of blended into a single blob, so they used some uh, technology to de-blend it and kind of give you the individual views. What I was talking about was a new impact crater. There you Check go. this out. A, gorgeous. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful shot. This was taken November 19th, 2013. Uh, it's a 30-meter crater on the surface of Mars. This was taken between July 2010, or I'm sorry, this happened between July 2010 and May 2012 because that's the interval between high-rise images in this region, and this was taken uh, with uh, the high-rise imager on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, this is cool because now we can actually see how planetary weather on Mars affects things in real time, which would be kind of important for when we send humans up there. Um, and impacts like this happen to the Earth and Mars all the time, but they generally aren't this big. Yeah, that one's sizable. Yeah, it's it's a pretty large impact. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about what we refer to as the second coming of space. How would you describe that? I, you know, I think we'll get into it after the break. Apparently, we're going to get into it after the break. St stay with us. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Space Recast. Um, uh, second coming of space. Yes. How would you describe this? So um, I sort of feel that uh, back in the Apollo days, mm -hmm. if you will, um, that, you know, because there was the Cold War and, and, and the U.S. versus Russia, and there was all of this sort of um, space awareness, if yep. you will. Now, granted, things were happening for the very first time, so of course people were very interested, uh, but it, it's significant that sort of, it feels as though everyone was interested, if, if that makes sense. The whole sense. world was watching Apollo. Yeah, quite Should... literally, right? So uh, this feels to me as though right now with the dawn of the internet and Twitter and, you know, everybody is so connected and you can share information so quickly to people who are interested in what you're talking about. It feels to me as though there is sort of this second awareness that's sort of going on right now. Um, I, and... It, I think because it's not just one person doing something or only two people doing something. I feel like everyone can do something if you really want to do something. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier about Patreon and how you can donate to Space Vidcast uh, because you and I decided that we wanted to do something. Uh, but other people can get involved in that way. But there's Kickstarter projects, Indiegogo projects, Kickstarter that was used by Planetary Resources. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they had a really successful project. Um, there's uh, Zoo Universe, which does more than just space-based uh, sort of things, but they have Moon Universe and Galaxy uh, Galaxy Zoo, sorry, Moon Zoo, Moon Zoo? I can't remember off the top of my head. But where uh, you can look at the different craters that are on the moon, and you can help identify new ones or uh, recategorize them. Uh, there's all of these different things that I think people can get really involved in and I think they are that's the best part uh, there's a hashtag going around for those of you who are on Twitter and have some maybe friend uh, friends in the space industry or who just happen to like space hashtag what is NASA for mm -hmm. and it's been really interesting to see what the different responses are again people inside the industry and outside of the industry you know why they care about NASA what makes a difference to them you know coming from NASA um, you know, all the different ways that NASA has impacted their lives and maybe have inspired them to go on and try to become a part of NASA or a different area of the space industry. There's also a, a really great Tumblr blog that a good friend of ours, DJ Dr. P, has started uh, called... William Pomerantz. That's an inside name. I apologize. William yes. Pomerantz. He's the... Uh... <laughs> 
Uh, you know, I don't remember his title, but he works, works for Virgin Galactic. He's up there. I think he's the director of special projects. Sure. Something along those lines. Uh, formerly with Google Lunar X Prize for a very long time. Uh, so the man knows what he's talking about. He's incredibly handsome and has amazing chairs. This is also very true. Uh, he has a Tumblr blog called Costs, or Cost, yeah, More Than Space dot com, or dot Tumblr dot com. I can't talk. I apologize. Let me try that again. Costs More Than Space dot tumblr dot com and it's really quite fascinating there's the sort of general things that most people are aware of that cost more than space mm -hmm. but he goes into you know how uh the olympics cost more than space yeah by a large large margin for sure but it's imp impressive to me the things that he's pointing out like say pet food as in according to the american pet products association americans just americans spend 20.64 billion with a B dollars on pet food in 2012, whereas NASA's budget for fiscal year 2012 was only 18.77 billion with a B for the entire agency, and that includes all of their projects, right. human or otherwise. It's insanity. So the Tumblr's really great. Uh, that's making the rounds, um, all of those sorts of things. And I, I just, I really love the idea that if you want to be involved, you can. Mm -hmm. And not just that there's all these options out there, but that people really are that interested and they are getting involved. I think it's a new kind of social... I, I think you hit on it earlier with uh, Patreon, for us at least, is, is a brilliant thing because it gives you an opportunity to uh, pay for something that you believe in. Um, Kickstarter is another really great campaign. Mm -hmm. I know I use it for programs that I believe in. Yes. Uh, Planetary Resources was one of them. I, I, th I think what they were doing was absolutely amazing. But there, there are other science proje projects that I um, subscribe to and pay for because th there are things that I think are important mm -hmm. and I realize that my tax dollars aren't going to go towards that and maybe they're not going to be able to find the funding somewhere else but it's still something that I think should happen. And so in we're living in this really great new area era of Patreon and Kickstarter. And um, not that long ago, uh, earlier this week, I actually I participated in a, a science Twitter chat. I was the space expert <laughs> of. Um, they didn't. Know. They okay. didn't know. Uh, space bad. expert for um, uh, something uh, for just a science chat hashtag science chat, and and that science chat began trending on Twitter for hours. Which, A, is awesome that that happened, that a science conversation it was a trending thing worldwide, yes. which goes to so, show people do want this stuff. Yes. But more, more, to that, more to my point here is that it's, it was all done by a, a company called Experiment or Experiment.com. And uh, they are a community of people going together, and it's kind of like a match between Patreon and Kickstarter, yeah. where you can fund these science projects that you think are important. And uh, it's a really... And... Not only can you fund projects, you can you can uh, obviously be part of the movement by with your wallet, mm -hmm. and that is no small thing, right? Right. Programs live and die by their budgets. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have the best project in the world, best program in the world. If you have no funding, you have no program. Right. So money is like it or not is uber uber apparent, uh, important. So not to minimize it, but if you don't want to pay for it, you can also create your own projects. Mm -hmm. uh, there was actually something earlier in our show that we didn't get to, it was a part of our, called a space cannon, it's on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. It's basically, it's exactly what it sounds like. It is a giant gun that shoots payloads into space. Now, you're not putting humans into space that no, way, they no, would go for splat, That's, that would be terrible, but imagine being able to put teeny tiny payloads into space for a fraction of the cost of what you can do now, multiple times per day. And I kind of want to be there when the gun goes boom. Right. Right. That's a Kickstarter project of putting things into space. It is an amazing kind of maker-ish time. And it's interesting because if you go back like one or even two years, I was like, mm, I'm not sure maker space can do much. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wrong. Straight up, that doesn't happen often, but I was wrong. Uh, maker space will completely and totally revolutionize all of space, I think, at this point. Yeah, oh yeah, 180. I, I was wrong. I was straight up wrong. Somebody I, marked I didn't this see, down. I didn't see it because I kept thinking big programs, putting right. humans into right. space. But it's not just putting humans into space. Absolutely. It's all of it. And all ships rise with the tide. So there's there's that too. And that's that's part of uh, what you said, like Space 2.0. As Ghost2501 uh, in the chat room said, uh, that's one hell of a cannon. <laughs> it is. Actually, if you search, uh, search Kickstarter for Space Cannon, yeah. uh, it is, in fact, one hell of a cannon. Yeah, it, it's crazy. I just, I really, 
sort of love and appreciate that whatever anybody is interested in, there's going to be a niche and there's a niche market for it and the market exists and you can get involved. It's, it's not just this sort of um, bypass sort of information where things are kind of happening and you sort of see it and you know that's cool and you can be a fan of it but now you can actually get involved in these things and uh, get other people interested in it. Uh, I, I just I love the there's another um, ISS uh, International Space Station notify uh, Kickstarter campaign. Going oh, that's done on. through a friend of ours, Liam. Yeah, Liam mm -hmm. Kennedy, uh, and he, it's it's as it sounds. Whereas when the International Space Station is coming nearby, but you know in your area, so you can go outside and see it, it will light up. It's a really cool thing, and it's also quite beautiful. You can just sort of have it on your desk and not really think about it, and then it'll go. Whoa! It'll sort of glow, and then you can run outside and grab your neighbors, and they'll wonder why on earth you're molesting them. And then you can just say, but look, there's people up there. Uh, and, and that's really cool. It's a really cool thing. And, and it's 200, right, as of right now, if you just search Kickstarter for ISS, it's 217% funded, mm -hmm. uh, which just goes to show that people want this stuff. Yep. Uh, and if you go back even you know, just kind of the middle of the space shuttle era, it feels like people didn't really want it. I think David in the chat room had a really interesting comment, sure. which was, uh, regarding the second coming, if launch prices fall over the next few years, then the amount of stuff being done in space will increase dramatically, boosting excitement. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's where things like the Space Cannon, which, by the way, is a crazy project, but I think hopefully a good crazy. That's where projects like that and these Kickstarter campaigns kind of come into play. It's not just it's not just launching stuff. It's being able to participate yes. in something, even if it's just from a monetary standpoint. Yes. Being able to feel like you're part of that project. Now you feel like you're participating in space because you are are participating in space you're helping to make it go and so I think it's a really it's a it's just really cool mini Elon brings up CubeSats another really yes. cool thing go back 10 years CubeSats weren't a thing well 10 years yeah 10 years we'll say 10 years go back 20 years CubeSats really uh -huh. really weren't a thing <laughs> um, yeah I mean uh, it it's it's awesome yeah how much stuff you can do in space now, and I think that because you've got all these smaller projects, not these gigantic Von Braunian kind of things, right? Right. That's what's spurring some of this excitement. It's awesome. I, we're definitely living in a really exciting time, particularly if you're a space nut. Uh, and Vax says Pomerantz is the vice president of special projects at Vice. Uh, it Virginia is vice Arctic. president of special projects. So there you go. Virginia. All right. There you go. Uh, so uh, that was our Space 2.0 little. Uh, Spiel, Spiel. right? And love to know what you think as well, by the way. We, we thrive off of your comments. This, the, the whole reason the show is live is so we can interact with you, we can talk with you, um, and so I don't have to edit. Uh, so, uh, what, I like how Tim in the back room is laughing at that as well. Uh, so what do you think? Uh, is, this, is this a fad is part of the, another mm -hmm. good question, mm -hmm. right? Because we had uh, some next-gen space programs in the 80s that never actually caught on from right. Boeing and whatnot. So is this a fad? Are these small projects just they're going to inspire temporarily, but because they're small, because they can't put humans into space, at least not today, although... Copenhagen, so I know I'm going to get yelled at, but Copenhagen may actually, Copenhagen suborbitals uh, may actually put a human into space. Outside of that, well, you know, maybe, why am I saying outside of that? Yeah, I don't know why. You're limiting yourself. Who, it's who's going to, who, is it, what do you think? There you go. <laughs> Not to mention, please tell us if we're wrong. For those of you who are oh, around. you think we're wrong. No, 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 but, but those of you who are around uh, during the Apollo era, era or the beginning of the space shuttle era, you know, while we were around for the beginning of the spatial era, we were we were kind of young and uh, may not remember it quite as vividly or accurately. Mm. I suppose um, you know maybe this is just for our generation that this seems really cool, and new, and shiny, and uh, everyone else is kind of looking at us like we're being stupid. I don't know. In the Apollo era, you couldn't you you could pay pay through tax dollars for Apollo, but you can say, you know what, I really think the turbo pump on the F1 engine is is a good project. Well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to fund that through right. Kickstarter. Well, that's why Which, I by the way, what an amazing Kickstarter campaign that would be, that would be right? So I'd be like, we're going to build a rocket engine. Here's the Kickstarter for the turbo pump. Here's the Kickstarter for the blah. Here's uh, ITAR issues. But whatever. I mean... <laughs> Imagine what you might be able to actually do through Kickstarter, just piecing it together, little pieces to make that go. Planetary resources, another but great example. We could be wrong. We could be wrong. All right, so uh, I'll get off the soapbox. Um, 
But let us know. Oh, actually, Colton brought up another good point before we go to break. He said, uh, I would say think of what Ford did. He split the job up to many and it rocketed, pun intended. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a really exciting time. I think this is Space 2.0. I think we're seeing a change in how space is done. Uh, but I'd like to know what you think. Are we changing space? Is it for the better? Ooh. Right? Is it for the better? What changes do you see? Do you agree with my assessment, uh, my complete 180 stance, that maker space will change the space industry? Or is it really going to continue to be large governments who... Get us back to the moon and on to Mars. And my challenge is for someone to answer every single one of those questions for Ben. <laughs> In one post and not make it 200 paragraphs long. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, comments from our last show. Stay with us. We'll be right back. One, zero. Lift off. The fleet of space shuttles are doing amazing things in space. We've got all your space geekery right here. And welcome back. I just realized I don't have any of my uh, notes in front of me, so I don't have any questions. Slacker. All right, here we go, here we go. These are uh, comments from our... It's our like you've never done this before. <laughs> Shows confuse me. <laughs> uh, comments from our last show. I also forgot to start my timer. Right. Uh, this is from Bill. He says, infrastructure that entails putting people outside close, close Earth orbit is cool. I think I read that right. Yes. Infrastructure that entails <laughs> robots in space... Okay. Infrastructure that delays or sucks money out of the above? Well, we've done that. Boots in space and oh, no, we've shown that we don't need the Senate to build rockets for us anymore. We've grown out of that. Basically slamming these space launch systems saying, look, this thing is expensive. It's pulling money from other programs. Do we really, really need that? Uh, or can we do something better with that money? And um, I don't know the answer to that, right? Uh, this was from last week's show, Infrastructure or Rockets. Right. Uh, or infrastructure or Destination, excuse there me. You go. Um, and um, basically asking, should we be building this space launch system, which has no destination whatsoever? It's just going to be huge. Um, it's, like, uh, it's like building a train, but not having any tracks to put it on. Ooh, good one. There you go. Good one. But you can build the tracks later, right? So you go, okay, now we've got this giant train. We need to build some tracks. So which, which do you build the tracks first or the train first? All right, which do you go? Yeah. Uh, good comment. I don't, I, you know, I don't know. Um, but uh, overall, just kind of a good comment. Uh, this one comes from Timothy. Timothy? He says, have a great anniversary trip together. We did. We yeah. went to Disney World. It was amazing. I am wearing a Horizons shirt right now. Uh, absolutely loved it. Right? So there. And for those who go to Disney World, go on the Mission Space Ride. It's a centrifuge, so you're going to be stuck in a small area and you're going to spin, so be aware of that. Um, and if you, as you're walking through the queue, if you look up at the space station, they have a, in the very middle of it, they have the old Horizons logo, which is what that building used to be. It's like a hidden stuck Mickey. Over there. It's kind of like, cool. Yeah, absolutely. It's really cool. And Mission Space, uh, I think is one of my favorite rides in all of Disney, just because it simulates that uh, launch experience. Absolutely loved it. So thank you. But then Timothy goes on to say... Two comments. Moving the ISS to a Lagrange 2 point would expose itself and astronauts to much more radiation. International Space Station is not designed for this. Second, near the end you said that there's no capability to get to Mars. It's not the point. Is that not the point of the space launch system to enable deep space manned flights? Uh, that is the point of the space launch system to enable deep space manned flights. Is the space launch system would be able to put humans on Mars. I think the thing is, the, what else, right? So if you don't have a destination in mind, if, you, if you're just building this giant thing, and you haven't said this giant thing is going to Mars, that's where it's going, you can't build it specifically to go to Mars. So do you need to bring your habitat with you? What happens when you get to Mars? And that's something that I think we should talk about in a future show. You know, we keep talking about putting humans on Mars, but what does that actually mean? Yay, a human has stepped foot on Mars. This can't be like Apollo. On right. Apollo, we were able to step foot on, Mar uh, on Mars, on the moon, and then get back in and leave right away. That is not a thing that can happen with Mars. When they get to Mars, whoever these humans are will have to stay there for a while, for probably a couple of years. Do stuff. So what infrastructure do they have? Do they have water? Do they have air? Do they have habitats? 
Did the robots go in advance? SLS answers none of these questions. I think the biggest thing that um, the uh, space launch system, the issue that they're having is the old saying of jack of all trades, master of none, right? It's yeah. trying to do too much on one vehicle. It's just trying to do a little bit of everything and it's not doing anything particularly well. And, and that's the issue that I think we're all sort of having with it. Uh, actually, David R. David, you've got a lot of comments. I keep bringing them up in the show. In the chat room says, Neil deGrasse Tyson argues that to create excitement and inspire people, you should advance the space frontier. In other words, anywhere beyond the moon. Pretty much. Uh, I, think, I think to really, truly add that inspiration, it's not just rovers, though. It's humans. We've got rovers beyond the moon. And they do inspire a little bit, but then people kind of go, yeah, robot. But when you put a human on there, just look at the difference between any cargo craft that is ever launched and the space shuttle and the number of people who watched that. The space shuttle launch had was just filled with people out of yep. the causeway. <clears throat> Other launches, not so much. There are still a few people who care, but that's exactly it, just a few people. The trick here is humans. We relate to other humans. We don't relate to robots. Sorry. Until we uh, are robots. Oh, but uh, in the first point of his question, um, uh, moving the International Space Station to a Lagrange point would expose itself and the astronauts to much more radiation. That is correct, although uh, radiation can be, uh, we can get around that. We'd have to think about it, but it's, it's not a showstopper completely. Um, so it, it's possible to engineer around that. But you are correct. The International Space Station is designed to work. It is actually technically still within the Earth's atmosphere and specific, more specifically magnetosphere. So um, it is being protected from a lot of solar radiation uh, or just in general radi radiation. Just radiation, cosmic radiation. So uh, you're right, but it's, it's solvable. It's fixable. Um, Fabio says... <laughs> I believe the space launch system will not go very far. In two years, we're going to have the Falcon Heavy operational and reusable with or without government funding. The price of launching a single space launch system will be so high that it will make a lot more sense to buy two or three Falcon Heavy and assemble a vehicle in orbit close to the International Space Station. From there, it could go to the moon or asteroids. The lunar descent vehicle could be a Dragon capsule. If it could do a powered landing on Earth, then it most probably could do a moon descent and ascension. Space launch system is just something to give jobs to old space. It will not go anywhere. It will only waste time and some billions of dollars. I assume I skipped one. No, I didn't. Yep. Okay. So that's a lot of assumptions. Uh, the first big assumption is that Falcon in two years, Falcon Heavy will be flying. Don't know. Second big assumption is that within two years, Falcon Heavy will be reusable. Don't know. Uh... I also like the Dragon capsule uh, doing a powered landing on Earth and then possibly a powered landing on Mars. Or, I'm sorry, the moon. On the moon. I don't know, don't right? Know I mean, either. there's a lot of we don't. Sure, on paper, all of that sounds great, but on paper, SLS sounds great too. So the, <laughs> <laughs> there's a difference between on paper and in practice. So yeah. we'll see. I, I, I have learned never bet against SpaceX. So I'm not. I'm not. And I'm not. Right? But. Uh, well, the you know, other... I'm not going to bet against SLS either. I'm not sure I agree with it, but uh, there's a lot of momentum behind it because it's such a big vehicle. So The other thing I thought was interesting, though, was saying that uh, the price of launching a single SLS will be so high that it will make a lot more sense to buy two mm. or three Falcon Heavy and assemble the vehicle in orbit. Right, so the cost of two or three Falcon Heavies will still be less than the cost of a, a SLS launch by... A lot. It's probably less than half. Sure. Right? So you could probably do, uh, let's see here, huh? you could probably do, I'm going to rough guess 10. I don't know for sure. I'm just making up numbers. Just so, I'm going to say you could do 10 Falcon Heavy launches for the cost of one SLS launch. But here's the thing to remember. Assembling in space is complicated and expensive. So even it's not though, like Star Trek. It's not like Star Trek. Even though you can get the payload up there in pieces, part of the reason the International Space Station is the most expensive structure humans have ever, ever built is because we assemble it in space part of the reason so yeah maybe you could get the launch costs down but now your in orbit or on orbit operation costs absolutely skyrocket i don't know to what so they may wash each other out and suddenly it doesn't it's now more cost effective yeah. it's even possible to go the other way and be less cost effective having no idea what the numbers really look at so i'm not saying that's what it would be i'm saying that's what it could, could be, be. And who knows? So 
it's a lot of assumptions to make. Um, there, there is something to be said for doing it the Skylab slash Apollo way, which is just right. one giant, just lofted up all at once, just boosh, off you go. Um, you know, that's what Skylab was. And Sky, Skylab was large, quite large, and it was done in one launch, right? Yeah. Moon landing, one launch per, per moon landing, mm -hmm. right? Same kind of thing. Uh, this message comes from uh, somebody. The uh, big head. <laughs> the, <laughs> Sorry. Incoming message. <laughs> Uh, this message comes from SC Decade. It says, NASA needs to make to take the money from the space launch system and lease space in commercial habitats and budget to each of NASA's research facilities and laboratories. This decouples launch uh, from specific mission and opens up NASA research to new projects in space. In other words, give each program, say, um, half a billion dollars maybe that's a bit much a quarter billion dollars per year or whatever it is uh, just say all right how about this every year there's two billion carved out in nasa's budget for launching everything sure. right and you got to fit every and they'll just take care of it two billion carved out they don't build rockets anymore they just say look we're going to buy it on this we're going to buy it on this we're going to buy it on this what best bang for the buck that we can get and we're going to launch whatever payload you've got up into space using the best rocket we can get for you know whatever it may be it's like an allowance well it, it, it's that's a great way to put that. Thanks. It? You get an allowance. You, you get an your allowance. Your programs get an allowance. Um, not a bad idea. Yeah. Not Interesting a, idea. I don't But then, who's going to advance humans into space? I think this is a big argument. We look at SpaceX and we go, yeah, they're trying to get to Mars, but what if they don't? What if something catastrophic happens and SpaceX goes away? What if? Right? I'm not saying it will. Just well, what they're if. not the only ones who want to go to Mars, yes, though. Yes, but who else has the means to actually pull it off today nobody but in the next 10 years possibly a couple other people that we may not or even be aware of right yeah now. but the government has the possibility of pulling it off too they well they have the means and almost the motivation but not necessarily going they to have do it. they have they have the ability to finance it and going back sure. to the beginning of the show it, money is critical in these things right so um, a lot of these other companies just don't have the monetary oomph to make this stuff go. Right. And Mars is hard. Mars, you need big, 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 big rockets to get to Mars. <laughs> That's a technical term. That's a G-Star. So, said. yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't see ULA doing it. I don't see Boeing or Lockheed stepping up saying, yeah, we're going to build a Saturn-class vehicle. Do you? So, they the pro those could, private companies, are, they could, I but mean, they're not. I mean, depending on what the issue is. Should their, you know, knock on wood, not be an issue. Uh, but should something catastrophic happen, I, I feel as though there would be um, a, a bit of a, a void. And there would be a need to be filled at that point. Does that make sense? I, I sort of feel as though... But it took them 10 years to get to that point. Sure, but I, I it's not like everyone else is just sitting on their laurels not doing anything. People are doing things, and it, it's... But the difference is, the difference is SpaceX isn't just doing stuff. Mm -hmm. They're clearly advancing towards Mars. Right. You look at everything they do, that's what they're doing. Well, they're advancing towards so, Mars. Yeah, I, they've I said it. it, that's what they're doing. <laughs> Who else is doing that? Arion Space, they're focused on lowering costs because SpaceX came in and fo basically forced their hand right. so that they can get satellites into orbit cheaper. Right, right. All right? Bo Boeing and Lockheed conglomerate ULA, right. they're looking to not necessarily lower costs, but keep their stranglehold on the expendable, evolved expendable launch vehicle market, right. which is the satellite payloads for military, so that they can keep charging half a billion dollars for per launch to put military satellites up there. Right. Then there's um, JAXA. Mm -hmm. They've got... The Japanese yep. aerospace. They're working on whittling down things and making it more... Uh, effective like they've got eight people that run their rocket now at the launch that's really freaking awesome off of just like laptops it's crazy yeah it's crazy it's but awesome. they're they're as far as i know they don't have any vehicles even remotely close to doing anything on mars i think the only country that maybe could do this is china mm -hmm. but i'm not seeing any plans from them to do this however you generally don't see plans from china in advance they go oh hey we're gonna launch to the moon tomorrow or no actually they're <laughs> gonna go no no what they're going to say is they're gonna go oh hey we successfully launched to the moon by yesterday. the way you guys yeah <laughs> we were totes there like yesterday yeah. i don't know why you didn't know about that before yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah good job on that so anyhow i, I don't know i i, I get i don't know 
I see what you're saying. I'm just trying to play devil's advocate to a certain extent and, and, and look at it from the other side. And I, I feel like, like I said, should, would something happen that I think that there would be a void to fill. And I think people really would step up. So, uh, interesting thing. The chat room's uh, hammering me because I'm not supposed to speculate about SpaceX. The reason is I do work at SpaceX. So, uh, and this show has nothing to do with SpaceX. And what I can't do is talk about anything that isn't publicly announced. Right. SpaceX has been very public about their plans to go to Mars. There is no doubt about that. That is everywhere. Elon says that. He's in interviews. I'm not talking about anything that isn't that already. That you guys don't knowledge. already know. This isn't. This isn't me giving you. That's why I'm able to talk about stuff like this. Now, I, I, you know, I don't. I guess I don't know. So uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, Fine. All right. Um, Next. No, that's it. I think. I think we're. Uh, I think we're done for the show. We, okay. we blew through all of our time, and, and yeah. there you go. So uh, once again, uh, anyone who uh, who can uh, help support the show, Patreon is a great way to help us go. It's a way for you to participate in the show and make sure that you get to see us week after week. Uh, there are costs to pr uh, producing the show, obviously equipment costs, but also hosting costs, right? So we're looking to move to live stream because of the uh, colossally huge YouTube live failure, uh, but that's 400 bucks per month. Now that gives you an ad free experience. Uh, it gives you a great player. It gives you the, the embedding back in the space. It gives you everything you want, but there's a cost associated with that and we're, we're just not there yet. Uh, so at the $200 mark, uh, we're going to be able to do um, uh, some additional gear. At the $400 mark, we're going to be able to do the live stream embedded on the Space Vidcast site. I think that's a really exciting point. Um, and then we even go all the way up to a $10,000 mark at $10,000 per live show, which I believe is possible. I believe that space is cool enough and science is cool enough and what we're doing is awesome enough and worthwhile enough to justify $10,000. In fact, we have more than that, that number of subscribers on YouTube. Yeah. So if every subscriber on YouTube just gave us $1 per show, we would more than exceed that particular goal. I, I realize I'm dreaming big, but I think the show is worth it. So at $10,000 per month, not only do I leave SpaceX and do this full time, but we also build our own Space Vidcast studio, populate it with people, and allow you to come in and watch the show get recorded live, and we do more shows. Shows. That is the bigger the bigger goal here, and um, the ultimate goal, of course, is doing this show live from some other celestial body, such as the moon or Mars. We could be the Oprah of space. We are the Oprah of space. That will be our new slogan. And then the you Oprah, get a moon trip, and the... you get a moon trip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna end on that particular high note. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. Thank you to all the Space Cast patrons who helped make this show happen, and we will see you next week.